it really occurred to me listening to your book again this last time and the style that you wrote it of like kind of addressing how you were coming to grips with some of these things as the process went. Like, I don't know when you decided to write the book. It must have been well after you gave it up. But you, the way you wrote it was like, you, you wrote it in a style of like, I was thinking about these things. I was trying to make this work. This were the, the mental gymnastics I was doing. And all the while, like the story of the bowl of, of sour cream dip or the bagel <laughs> with double cream cheese. Double like that must have been like, oh my God, those cravings <sighs> were just like, smashing like a cube of butter or something yeah. like it sounded like they were through the roof it's horrible and i also mentioned that book reading this account of people who had survived a japanese prison camp and then they get back into i don't know it was america or england it was one or the other and they're presented with this feast and all they eat is the fat they eat every drop of fat off that table and then they like poke their heads up and look at okay what else is here because the craving for fat is so intense and I can so relate to that because that's what it was like when you saw animal fat on the table, it was like, don't even look at it because you know you're gonna be <laughs> craving. And you feel like a horrible person for even thinking about it because you, now you're the evil oppressor who's hurting animals. Um, and it also makes no sense because you're not supposed to feel this. So why do I feel this so strongly? Yeah, and there was that period when I was, I think I was 24, 25 and I was getting for six weeks, Twice a week, I stopped and got that bagel with the double cream cheese. And at the end of six weeks, it was like, this is horrible. You have to stop. It's, you know, you're completely betraying everything. You're hurting the animals and you're, you know, everything's going to collapse if you keep down this path. And the only way to stop doing it was to change the way I walked so that I wasn't going by that place where they sold it because I could not stop thinking about that cream cheese. It was all I could think about. It's like, this is starvation, what you're doing to yourself. That's not normal. You shouldn't be obsessed with cream cheese. But it was like, please just give me some more fat, please. Cause I would feel so good for like two hours after eating it. And then I just, I yanked myself back from sanity. It was like, don't do it. It's a terrible, terrible thing. You can't oppress wow. the animals, don't, you know? So I was like, I, I made myself, like I said, the white knuckling is like, just don't, don't do it. Don't walk there. Don't think about it. Drive it from your mind. And then, you know, it'd be like years, two, two, three years would go by. I was like, I had kept it that much under control, but then the next little temptation would come up and you'd be like, oh, I want that piece of cheese. Please let me have some of that. And then like, uh, you know, split a piece of pizza with someone and then feel like the most horrible person on the planet because you had yeah. been in. It's awful. It's just an eating disorder. That's all it is. Yeah. The guilt and the cognitive dissonance of it's, just yes. feeling terrible. What, what yeah. I believe and my actions are not jiving. That's a huge problem, huge problem in our, in our feeble brains. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, I, I really appreciate you telling your story and, and relating some of the health issues. I did want to talk about the environmental issues because I, I, I said this last time, I, I believe this this time as well, and I know you do too. People go vegetarian and vegan for the very best yeah. reasons. They so do. noble, so caring. They love the animals. They love the planet. They want to do their part. And everybody knows exactly. Look at those fur babies. Oh, yeah. cute. <laughs> we, we love the animals. We love the planet. We, we want to do the right thing. And so we get sucked into this story of like animal agriculture is terrible. Agriculture of plants is so much better and it saves the planet. And I want to go back to one particular really influential moment in your life where you saw I, I believe it was a professor or a teacher of some kind that wrote agriculture equals culture and like or civilization and it's like civilization is amazing and we have Mona Lisa and great music and all this stuff and it's like that came from agriculture amazing why why, why would we not think agriculture is the best thing ever Right. And so that's the story. And it's very sort of ennobling, you know, so, oh, look at human progress. Look what we did. We were all starving and freezing and terrible. And we wallowed in the mud and we lived in caves and whatever. And then we figured this thing out, how to get our own food. And from there, stability was inserted into human lives. And we were able to have, um, you know, divisions of labor and people were able to specialize. And then they learned how to do all these things like music and pottery. Governments and, and religions yeah, and all these great, things. wonderful prisons and mass starvation <laughs> and war and slavery, right? All of this actually wrecked human culture, but that's not the story we're told. So, so we have to start from the very beginning. What is agriculture? Well, you take a piece of land, you clear every living thing off it. And I mean, down to the bacteria, and then you plant that land just for humans. 
So right away, you've got the mass extinction problem because all those plants and animals have nowhere to go. They're just sent off into the dark night of extinction, never to be seen again. And that's what it's done around the globe. It, agriculture has taken every conceivable inch that it could take. There's nothing left. Like all the continents that could be breached are gone. Um, Antarctica, but you know, hey, we're gonna get that one with global warming. Uh, but that's it, that's all that's left. So, <laughs> and then what happens? Well, now the problem is we've mentioned drawdown. You're on drawdown because you're, what you have is like, there's a, it makes the city possible because you've got all these people that don't have to grow food, other people are growing it, but now you're dependent on the hinterlands. You're always dependent on the colonies because that city, if you think about it, everything has to come from somewhere else. The food, the water, the trees, energy, fish, whatever you're doing, whatever you're eating, it all has to come from somewhere else. Think about New York, there's no food. You can't grow food. It's nothing but concrete, stone, whatever, like buildings, you know, there's no, it's not where food comes from. So it all has to be imported. And now the problem is you're dependent on this supply chain. And what if the people who live next door don't wanna give you their food, their soil, their trees, their water, their fish, and they don't, nobody willingly gives up their stuff to give to you. Um, and so from that point forward, it doesn't actually matter what beautiful values people in the city might hold in their hearts. You are dependent on imperialism and genocide. You have to conquer your neighbors because you've used up your stuff. You have to conquer your neighbors and take their stuff. And part of their stuff is of course human beings because it's backbreaking labor agriculture. It's just dawn to dusk. Um, and for anyone to have leisure, you have to have slaves. So, you know, we think of places like Athens in ancient Greece, one of the birthplaces of democracy. Well, you know, 94% of the population was literally slaves. That's right. So you're, just, you're only talking about 6% of the population that got to be citizens. They got to do all that great stuff. And they did some marvelous things and they built some amazing buildings and there's beautiful statues. And I can certainly, you know, appreciate that. But that's what it rests on is slavery. And the only reason we've forgotten this is because for 200 years, we've been using fossil fuel instead. So we were able to get rid of slavery, but that's why. The year 1800, which is when slavery begins, uh, the fossil fuel age begins, is when we start really using coal. Um, at that point, year 1800, fully three quarters of the human beings on this planet, three quarters were living in some form of slavery, indenture, or serfdom. Three quarters. Wow. That's what agriculture demands. And if you ever try it, you will see that this is true. Um, yes, and then you're on drawdown. So you're using up all your stuff, and then you're desperate and you're living in a city. So you've got way too many people will never be supported on what land is there. And so you have to go out and steal stuff. So now you need a military. And then when you get all that stuff back, you need someone to protect it. So you're gonna call that either the military or the police. And also you can't have vast numbers of people in slavery without a military. And now you're gonna need a government. You're gonna need a hierarchy. You're gonna need someone to administer it. And now you're gonna need laws because you've got thousands if not millions of strangers all living together, tightly packed, and you need some way for them to settle disputes without murdering each other. So Hammurabi's code comes into being because you can't just sit face to face. There's this number, I can't remember the guy's name, it's somebody's number. And that's the point past which humans break down in communication. And it's usually like about 100, 125. 150, I think is yeah, what I've heard. You can have about that many and there's, the relationships at that point aren't too complex. You actually can make decisions face to face. And that's basically the hunter gatherer number. That's, you know, that's how we evolved is in those small family bands. And that just, you bust right through that and it's impossible. You can't have 10,000 or a hundred thousand or a million people sit face to face and make decisions. It just, it can't be done. So yeah. you have to have some kind of formal law. The state has to be the only thing that can, can enforce with violence. Everybody else has to give up violence so that Otherwise, we're all just going to murder each other, right? So you see how it comes into being. You have the social contract. It's better than nothing. But <laughs> we didn't always live this way. There's another way. And, you know, we two and a half million years we were on this planet. And we didn't wreck the place. We didn't destroy right. it. And That's we right. were basically pretty nice to each other for the most part. I'm not saying it was perfect. But it's a very different worldview and a very different kind of um, culture. And it's not civilization, it's, some, it's another kind of, it's a culture, but it's not civilization. Civilization right. is agriculture and cities. Civilization literally means a way of life based on cities. That's etymologically yeah. what it means. So right. when people say, oh, civilization, I don't mean to insult hunter gatherers. They have very complicated cultures. It's just not civilization. 